Thank you for tuning in to another faith-growing message from Mercy Hill Church with Dr. J.P. Price. Stretching around the globe, Mercy Hill Ministries is based in Blairsville, Pennsylvania. Mercy Hill is not your typical church. Our messages are for the hungry, for the seeking, and for those wanting more in our school of discipleship, both locally and internationally. We exist to transform followers into leaders and leaders into warriors for Christ. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you grow deeper in Christ and uncover your purpose. Now, let's go into today's message. Father is not as valuable as the work of a mother. Regardless of the working family, regardless of the stay-at-home mom kind of family, I preached that um, we are devaluing men by telling them that because we rear the children and they bring home the paycheck that they didn't rear our children. And I preached that that was a shame and that that's what's wrong with our society and we're raising our men to think that they don't matter. And that's the problem. And then we wonder why feminism is taking over. I'm not saying that they're not, we're not on the same wavelength. I was just, man, those men though, the way they received me. Every single man in that place came up to me afterwards and said, in, in one word or another, they said, never met a woman that understood it. And I said, I didn't understand it until I understood my father. And then he showed it to me. He showed, because, why? Because I was a liberal. <laughs> when I came to Jesus, I was a liberal feminist, ready to fight. Let me tell you, I was never pro-abortion. But I, I was a liberal. And he had to show me how wrong I was. And how the entire movement that I supported was a toxic, poisonous movement. So after that, I preached to the, the people at Laurel Swamp, and they, they turned around, and every one of them hugged me. And I, I drove I'm going to cry. I drove home from Laurel Swamp that day. Um, I drove home from Laurel Swamp that day knowing that I had a whole church full of fathers that would have my back no matter what. And that's something for someone who never had a dad. Mm. Um, so it's, it's crazy to stand back here in Mercy Hill's pulpit when I've been kind of dipped into a whole other life over in Climber, PA, that I wouldn't trade for the world. I love those people so much. They've taught me a lot. I'm learning from them just as much as they're getting something from me. But praise God. Let's pray real quick, and everybody, you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the way that you've changed me. I thank you for the transformative process, Lord. I thank you for, for the way that you remove old roots and the way that you give us things that we never thought we could have, like giving a 33-year-old woman a room full of fathers when she thought it was too late to have one. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go into uh, John chapter 3. I didn't know I was going to do that and cry in front of you within the first two minutes standing up here, so that's where we're going to be tonight. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jesus. He's already going to make me cry, and then this should be fun. So I was thinking about what I was going to preach about. And um, I asked, I mean, because I found out at lunchtime that I was preaching. So <laughs> I, was, I was taking a bite of my BLT. And JP said, by the way, you're preaching tonight. And I said, why did you tell me while I'm eating my sandwich? He said, I was hoping you'd lose your appetite and I could eat the rest of it. <laughs> it was a BLT. And it was the last one I was out of bacon. I made two for him, two for me, and the kids got ham and cheese. And yeah, so... He wanted, you know, he was done with his before I had even gotten halfway through my first one. So he wanted the rest of them. Didn't lose my appetite, though. So I got bacon in my belly right now. <laughs> so um, so I, I asked him, I said, he said, it's got to line up. However you want to tie it in, whatever you want to do, whatever God wants to do. And I said, uh, what, was the, what was the takeaway last week? And he said, um, he increases and you decrease and you know he refreshed me a little bit on some of the stuff he talked about last week and then he made the suggestion to talk about 
Nicodemus. So for the last um, for the last couple hours, I've been in and out of the Word between taking care of the kids, and I was reading John three, where uh, Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born again. And it's one of those verses. It's one. It's one of those passages that we just kind of skim over because we know about it, right? You must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven, and we've heard it preached that you know you have to be born of water and born of the Spirit, and we know that that water is not the baptism as as much as it is the the birth, the natural birth process, to be born of the water, right? So then I'm looking through the inner linear because before I preach on, normally I get up here with no idea what I'm going to talk about, and then he gives me a verse while I'm up here or on my way up or something crazy. But since I knew what I was preaching on today, I did a word study because if I know what I'm preaching on, I like words. So I'm going to look them up. And I said, okay, Lord, what, what words do you want? Because I just wait for him to highlight a word to me. And he said, again, I want you to do a study on the word again, where it says born again, because that's not what I said. Uh, oh, oh, okay. It's, yeah, of course he said born again, but that's not what the word meant in its entirety. See, one of the greatest disservices that we do in language, period, and I'm learning this because I'm learning the German language, is I want to be able to talk to Matthias and hawk loogies at him back when he does it to me. <laughs> That's the whole language, I swear. Um, <laughs> it's just angry and hawking loogies the whole time. So, I, so I've learned that in language, there it's so it's so diverse in how words are. It's so very diverse. So in the Greek and in the Hebrew that our word is written in, we see words that mean something entirely different or something deeper than it did than it does when we use a simple word like the word again. Who would do a word study on again? I've done word studies on gentleness, meekness. I've done word studies on submission. I've done, you know what I mean? Like those words, you, but the word again is one that you would just skip over. So I did this word study on the word again, and I was absolutely floored, as I always am when he tells me what to do, and I listen. <laughs> um, I was absolutely floored. The word in Strong's Concordance um, uh, is, actually means from above. But the way that it is used here in this scripture is from the beginning or from their origin. Okay? So let's read it through John, uh, chapter, John chapter 3. Yeah, we'll read John chapter 3, and I'm going to read that those words to you, the way that it would have been translated, if translated to mean exactly what word he was talking about. So there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus knew because of the signs and wonders that Jesus was doing, Nicodemus, like, he obviously is of God. Nobody else could do this unless he was from God. So Nicodemus already knows who he is and, and has said who he is. And Jesus says to him, As assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born from the origin. What is the origin? Well, Jesus is the origin, right? First born of many brethren. That's what he's called. Or we could go all the way back to the first, the first righteous seed of man, which was Adam. So we have Adam, or Adam, the collective being, and then we have Jesus, the last man Adam, right? So those are the only two that are origin, the origin, the collective being. The first man Adam and the last man Adam. These are origins. Because we see in the word, firstborn of many brethren, of many brethren. So that's the beginning of a new species. So Jesus was the beginning of a new species, but that species was from the origin that it was created to be in the first place that was then corrupted by the fall, by sin, when sin entered. It was corrupted, and then Jesus brought it back to the origin, and now we must be born of the origin, the beginning. The word translates from above, and that translate the word is anothen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't study Greek. I did a little bit. I studied a little bit. but um, And it means from the origin, from the beginning. 
So we have to be born from the beginning. What is the beginning? In the beginning, God. So what do we have to be born from? Being born again. That's why Nicodemus was so confused. He was like, what do you mean? And Jesus was like, you have to be born from the beginning. You have to be born from the origin. You have to be born again. So when we say that we're born again believers, we have to be born from the origin. Now wait, because there's more. I did more word studies. I don't stop there. Right, because I get excited, right? After something like that, I'm like, ooh, the origin. This is good. And then I start receiving revelation, and the Holy Spirit's like, good, keep on going. I'm like, yay, words. Jesus and words. Okay, so then... Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then we go on to say, uh, Jesus goes on to say, after Nicodemus, of course, goes, I don't understand. How can these things be? Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? I love the way he talks to people. You're supposed to be the smart one here. How do you not know this? Most assuredly, I say to you, We speak what we know and testify what we have seen, but you do not receive our witness. Well, but Nicodemus has already said, you must be from God. We saw the stuff that you did. And Jesus is saying, you saw the stuff that we did. We've testified to you what we've seen, but you don't receive our witness. What does he mean? So I, of course, looked it up. What does the word receive mean? Hmm. To be married to. To be married to it. What does that mean? To to become one flesh with the witness. One flesh with the spirit. One flesh with the testimony. To become ingrained in you so much so that you are now a part of it. And it is now a part of you to become one flesh with the testimony. Because we have testified of the things that we've seen, and we have, we have shown you the things that can be done, and you have not married it. What do you do when you marry someone? You become one flesh And then you create and birth something from that. From the intimacy of the witness, we receive and are able to be married to the very testimony that we see, hear, and read. Become so intertwined with that testimony that we are bound to birth something from within us. To birth something. That it becomes so real that the relationship between us and the witness within us becomes so real, so tangible, so palatable, that something is birthed from it that can walk the earth. And there is faith. There is being able to lay hands on the sick. To be so intertwined with truth. Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, hold on, let me get back to it here. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not marry our witness. Why? He's saying, why is this in here? Why is this in here? Because we don't seem to understand as a church whole, and I'm not talking about Mercy Hill, I'm talking about the body of Christ in general, Christian. We do not seem to understand exactly how this whole bridegroom, bride thing works with our husbandmen. The receptive, the, the, the being receptive portion of being the bride 
is so important to be receptive, to be able to be trained, to be able to be taught, to be able to be changeable, teachable, moldable by our husbandmen to the point where the testimony that is given to us is so intertwined with us that the relationship and the intimacy with the husband is so inter intertwined with us, so ingrained with inside of us, that we birth something. Am I talking about in the natural? Absolutely not. I'm talking about something is going to come out of me that would not have come out of me. What is that? Compassion? Kindness? Meekness? Gentleness? We could name all nine of the fruit of the Spirit and then some? change, transformative power, me being able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, the type of thing I saw here with James three, three years ago, four years ago now, three years ago. My goodness, if you don't know that story, I'll tell you right now. This young man was born without an optic nerve, correct? Optic nerve. He was born without one. It's not there. It's still not there. Greg Boyd came up here stood in front of everybody and asked for prayer, and James came up, and he sat him in a chair, and we all started praying over him. Whew. The moment that boy said, I can see light. He has no optic nerve. It is scientifically impossible for him to see light, yet he can go to the doctor right now and get a report that says that he's a miracle because he has sight in that eye. And sometimes I try to play games and test it and come at him from that side. Just <laughs> make sure. Oh, that's don't work. All right. <laughs> and, and we kept praying. He saw light and we kept praying. And how many fingers am I holding up? And can you see my face? And who's standing in front of you? And covering up one eye and... Man, I've never seen anything like that before in my life, and I was sold. Why are we not married to that witness? Why, as a church, are we not married to that type of witness? Because I should, be, I should have that so ingrained in me that when someone can't see, I go, I got you. Let's do it right now, and I'm not moving until it happens because it will happen. I've seen it. I'm married to it. I know that testimony. I've been there. I saw it. That's my husbandman. Why are we not married to it? I can testify to healing from kidney disease that has taken out half of my family. I mean, it's literally been the death of half. My grandmother died on dialysis with one, one kidney functioning, and it wasn't functioning the whole way. I mean, diabetes, the whole, every, every problem that you can have that involves kidneys, my family's had it. Sponge kidney, pyelonephritis, pyelonephritis with sepsis, you name it, it's on the paperwork with somebody's name on it that is in my family tree. Why? I don't know, because we let it in. I got healed. And I'm telling you, we went to go do um, a food box distribution. Was it last year with Derek? Was it last year? Okay, so last year we went to do a food box distribution. This lady gets out of her car and she goes, <sighs> we said, you know, after we give them their food, we pray with you for anything and she said I have kidney disease and I about knocked over three people trying to get to her because I'm married to that one that's mine I know that I know that I can lay hands on somebody who has kidney disease and I know they're getting healed because if I got it you can have it I'll impart it I'm ready to go I about knocked you over somebody says they have kidney disease and I hear it from across the room I'm running and you're probably going to get prayer even if you don't want it because I'm I'm here for it Game on. I'm married to that. I, why are we not married to the witness? What have you received a healing from? Amber, she had a rotator cuff issue. I know that when I had issue with pain in my shoulder, and I was like, man, my shoulder hurts. Amber was one of the first people to go, have you had anybody pray over it? I was like, uh. yeah, she was getting ready to go in for surgery, and a miraculous healing took place. She's married to that one. When her shoulder hurts, she just, no. Nope. Right? I had, I had um, plantar fasciitis, and it hurt to walk every day. I'm married to that healing. I know. When someone says, oh, I think, like, I have this pain in my feet, and it's worse in the morning, and I'm like, I know what that is. Let me touch your feet. And then I look weird, right? <laughs> Let me get your feet. I'm married to that. 
I know that when there's addiction, I can pray over you because I watched my dad get healed and I watched my uncle get healed and I watched deliverance happen. I know it. I can, I'm, I'm married to it. Why are we not married to the witness? Why are we not married to the witness? What did Jesus say? Most assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but you are still not married to it. Now, why is he saying this in conjunction with the whole must-be-born-again thing? Because they're completely ingrained. Because when you are born again, born from the origin, it should be so intertwined and ingrained in you that you are married to that powerful husbandman of yours. That it is immovable, unshakable, unstoppable, and you know who that is. And what you got. Hmm. If I told you earthly things, verse 12, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come from heaven, that is the Son of Man who was in heaven. Hmm. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Who is he talking about? He's saying... I'm telling you what I know, and nobody else has been where I've been. I've been the only one that's been there, and I'm telling you what I know. And if you can't believe the things here that you've seen and that I've told you have happened here, how are you going to believe what I'm telling you about that? If you, it, Hello? Does anybody hear me? If you can't believe that James received sight sitting in this building while somebody's praying over him, how in the world are you justifying in your head that you're going to get into heaven? Do you even believe it's real? Because the same power, hmm, because the same power he gave to us, the same power dwelling in heaven, the things that we loose in heaven, we loose on earth, and the things that we bind in heaven are bound on earth. So if we, if, if the power's there, right, you know and you can say it, you can sing the song, God, you're all powerful, God, you're almighty, oh, Lord, you're my healer, you're the redeemer, Jesus, I know you died for me, and you can't lay hands on your neighbor because you're afraid, what is wrong with us? Why are we not married? And then we wonder why the husbandman ain't come back yet, because we're not acting like the bride. He's coming back for a bride who's prepared herself. Do you know what the Jewish tradition of marriage was? Let me tell you about the Jewish tradition of marriage. Man, did it floor me. The Jewish tradition of marriage, of course, some of them were arranged marriages and whatnot, but when a, when a wife and a husband picked each other, right, and they were betrothed, I'm going to cry, cry every time. Hmm. Because I don't understand in my head why the Jews don't see Jesus. You know what I mean? Sometimes that's why I cry. Hmm. So the husband, the soon-to-be husband and the soon-to-be wife, the fiancés, if you will, are betrothed to one another. And the father of the, of the husband, the soon-to-be husband, tells him, go prepare a place. So he goes to prepare a house. And all the while, and this has to be at least a year, okay, that he is preparing and building the home. This is old Jewish tradition. He's pre preparing and building the home. And I mean, this house has to be perfect. And he's putting his blood, sweat, and tears. And because it's a year, this man has very little help because he's supposed to prepare it for his bride. He's doing it by himself, right? And every now and then, his father will come in and he'll check the home. And every now and then, when his father comes in and checks the home, he tells them what needs fixed because only the best for my daughter, right? Only the best for my daughter-in-law. And he's making sure that everything's good, right? The flooring's strong and sturdy. The walls are built properly. Every step that is taken, he has to come in and he has to check the house. And when, the, when the studs go up and they start to put all of that, I don't know much about this stuff, but when the studs go up and they start to put all of that up, you know, the father-in-law's going to come in and go, I don't know about that. Take it down and rebuild it. And the son's like, damn. And all the while, here's the, the soon-to-be bride is over here, right? She's in a completely different area of the town, sometimes completely out of town. And what is she doing? Whew. Hmm. She's doing what we're supposed to be doing. Every day, she washes and irons and presses and, and mends, 
men's because she's doing this every single day. She washes irons, presses men's, perfumes, fixes, sews, adds to, takes away from, and perfects her wedding dress. And then every night she puts her wedding dress on and she goes to bed in her wedding dress, waiting for her husbandman. And then there's the husbandman every day, pounding on the walls and doing the. And then one day, usually about a year or so later, now remember, nobody knows the day. The father's the only one that knows the day. Sound familiar? So the father comes into the house and he sees it, and the son's like, What about now? And he's waiting for him to find something wrong because he's been finding something wrong. At like every other week for a year, and he comes in and he goes, looks good, go get her. And that, in that moment, the son takes off, and he's going, and he's running, and he busts down the door, and he takes his bride like a thief in the night. And he takes his bride, and then the whole city wakes up, and they have a huge party. And this party goes on for days and days and days because they've waited for so long and she prepared every night and he prepared every day. And that's what we're supposed to, that's what being married to the witness is, is preparing ourselves for the return of the husbandman, getting ready. So what are we supposed to be doing? Washing ourselves drenching ourselves in oil, making sure we smell good, making sure we look pretty, making sure I'm at my cleanest. My toenails are clipped, my nails are painted, my hair's did, my makeup's on, and I'm ready because one night he's going to show up, so I'm ready every night, right? And I make sure that every tear that has taken place in this dress because I've worn it every single day is mended every day, and the dress is washed every day because when he comes through that door, it's going to be sparkling white, because I'm waiting for him. And she does nothing else but take care of her wedding dress and her body and adorn herself. That's the process. So when he says, to why have you not received our witness? Why have we not been married to? Why have we not been waiting for? Why are we not waiting on God? Why, why is it that when I pray for somebody, I go over and, you know, I say the, Lord, please heal them. And, and, <laughs> please? No, I know my husbandman's going to show up. I know he's going to show up. I know he's going to show up. We should know. We should be so married to the process that we don't question it. Hmm. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is condemnation. That the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. What are we talking about here? Well, in light of everything else that we just read, this is one of those therefore moments, right? So what is it there for? Now, we already know that he has talked about being born again, and we already know that he has talked about being married to the witness, right? Being so, having it so ingrained in us that we are immovable and unshakable in that witness, right? That we stand firm. Because when we've done all we can do to stand, stand therefore. But then says, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Now when I read this before a million times, I thought, okay, we're talking about, we're talking about 
you know, doing bad things and them coming to light and doing good things and people being able to see your good things. But then I saw that the context of the verse is more geared towards the spirit, right? Walking in the flesh, walking in the spirit. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So what kind of deeds are we talking about here that have been done in God? What kind of deeds are we going to present to God? What kind of deeds are you bringing to light before what, what bringing to light? What is light? He is light, right? What are what kind of deeds are bring, are you bringing to light? What kind of deeds are you bringing to God? When was the last time that you laid hands on somebody? When was the last time that you led somebody in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When was the last time that you prayed with somebody when they told you that their head hurt. It doesn't have to be something huge. That's why I went to head hurt, right? Because it's the little things, too. Because we're supposed to be married to the witness. We're supposed to have it so intertwined with our spirit that that which is born of spirit is spirit. Or in the Greek, it says, that which of born is spirit, spirit is. It changes everything that you are when you receive, as he said, receive the witness. Why have we not received, as the church, why have we not received the witness? Why have we not married ourselves to it? Why have we not intertwined ourselves to it to a point where we don't move and we know and it has become a part of us? Have you ever heard of a transplant patient, like just feeling like they know something about somebody because there's a part of their body in them. Now, I don't know how true that is. I don't really know transplant patients. But in my mind, that's what this is. Is that he implants himself in us and therefore, we should be, we should be knowing him on a level of, of what a transplant patient would say. Like, they're just a part of me. I can't explain it. It's like I just know them, and I never knew them, right? And, what, and sometimes they even say, they start to like the foods that the other person liked, and they start to talk the way, hello, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be transplanting our spirit. It's like a transplant. It's like an organ transplant, but it's a spirit transplant. We transplant our spirit, and now if we don't start looking like him, something's wrong, because we're supposed to be married to the witness. We're supposed to be inseparable. We're supposed to be so intertwined that you would have to try to take it from me and I would, I would not let you. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? That it's so much a part of me that you would physically have to try to take it from me and it's not going to happen because I'm not moving until I, it, it happens. Whatever that is, the healing, the provision, whatever it is, you're going to have to try to take it, pry it from my hands. Another word for um, receive is grasp in the Greek. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say there? Is that it's supposed to be something that we have. It's a part of us. Just intertwined in our very being. As though our cells are made up of it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. We thank you for your promises, Lord. We thank you for, for everything. Mm. Thank you, Jesus, for showing me this. I thank you, Lord, for, for helping me to inquire on these words so that I could get a deeper understanding of your words, so that I could get a deeper understanding, and then I can do something about it and transform and change who I am by allowing myself to become married to the witness and that I know who you are because... My faith is so intertwined and my spirit is so intertwined with yours, Lord, that nobody can pry us apart. No one can snatch me out of your...